Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Scholarly Contributions, African-American Professional Philosophers. When you've already tried setting traps for the rodents, or using a plunger to unclog the toilet, or pressing Control-Alt-Delete to restart the computer, there's no shame in admitting to yourself that you need to stop relying on your limited skills and call that exterminator, plumber, or computer repair person. Sure, you could in theory at least figure out how to do it yourself, but why not benefit from the years of training and experience that a professional has? And what about when it comes to actual theories, that is, philosophical ones? Well, some of us are lucky enough to do philosophy for a living. Unlike exterminators and plumbers, we professional philosophers don't usually make house calls, unless you count online classes delivered straight to the comfort of your bedroom. But like them, we do get paid, even if most of us would keep doing philosophy in our spare time if we couldn't make a living at it, and please don't mention this to the universities of Dalhousie and Munich. Indeed, you don't have to be a professional philosopher to do philosophy. This should be clear in any circumstance, but is especially obvious in the context of this podcast series, in which figures like Anton Wilhelm Amo and Alain Locke have stood out as exceptions to the rule in being professionally trained philosophers. In our story of Africana philosophy, most of the great philosophical voices had no formal training as academics, and no experience of philosophy as a profession. And this will, to a great extent, continue to be the case even as we move through the rest of the 20th century. In a recent book entitled African American Philosophers and Philosophy, An Introduction to the History, Concepts, and Contemporary Issues, John McClendon III and Stephen Ferguson II raise critical questions about the tendency to tell the story of African American philosophy in this way. They do not deny that figures like Maria Stewart, Martin Delaney, Claudia Jones, and Malcolm X form a crucial part of the history of African-American philosophy, but they do criticize an impression given by texts introducing readers to African-American philosophy, namely that any professional philosophers worth reading have only been active starting in the final third of the 20th century. They point out that Locke is the only academic philosopher active before 1965 who can be found in the major textbooks devoted to this topic. They deem the presupposition that somehow only during our contemporary time do we find that African-American philosophers made real first strides in academic philosophy to be patently ahistorical and grossly inaccurate. Against this, their book highlights African-American professional philosophers, especially those active in the century spanning from 1865 to 1965. They do not pursue a strictly chronological ordering, but rather explore how African-American philosophers during this time dealt with themes such as religion, science, value, and the question of what philosophy is. We will turn our attention in this episode to some of the names they bring to attention. A few points about scope are worth mentioning. Like McClendon and Ferguson, we'll start in the 19th century, but most of the figures we will be discussing operated during the 20th century, which is why we've placed this topic here in part three of our series. Furthermore, the story of Africana philosophy as a professional enterprise obviously includes not only what happened in the United States, but also in places like Africa and Europe. But we've already covered several of the relevant thinkers who trained or worked in those places in the last few episodes of part one of our series, so here our focus will be on the U.S. Let us proceed by considering some milestones in the tale of African Americans entering the profession of philosophy. 1865 is a good place to start. In this year, the Civil War ended slavery, and Patrick Francis Healy received his doctorate in philosophy from the University of Louvain in Belgium becoming the first African-American to achieve a PhD, not just in philosophy, but in any subject. Quite an accomplishment for someone who was legally a slave at birth. But Healy exemplifies the difficulties and tensions inherent in telling the story of race in America, as he did not openly identify as Black. The son of a plantation owner and an enslaved mother in Georgia, he and some of his brothers were sent by their father to study at the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. From this time onward, they passed as white whenever possible. This enabled Healy to go from getting his doctorate in Belgium to teaching philosophy at Georgetown University, 
and ultimately becoming the university's president. He is therefore now recognized as the first black president of a predominantly white university. But should we celebrate him as such when he purposefully did not live as a black man? We can't in any case see him as a contributor to African-American or Africana philosophy. As we explained in the very first episode of our series, our focus is on philosophical thought that is in some way distinctive in theme or approach as a result of emerging from Africa and its diaspora. We know of no contribution by Healy that would fit this bill. Richard Theodore Greener and Thomas Nelson Baker, by contrast, are pioneering figures who did clearly advance both the story of African-American professional philosophers and African-American philosophy. Greener was born free in Philadelphia in 1844, but grew up in Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 1870, he became the first black person to obtain a degree from Harvard. This was a bachelor's degree. Greener never obtained a doctorate, though he would eventually get a law degree. But he is nevertheless important to the history of African Americans in the profession, because he went on to become a professor of moral and mental philosophy at the University of South Carolina. This was possible thanks to the special circumstances of the Reconstruction period, during which the University of South Carolina became the only Southern state university to accept and educate black students. For a brief time, it was even the case that a majority of the student body was black. As a biographer writes, Greener was an eloquent and determined advocate for racial uplift. In 1894, he published an article titled The White Problem, a bold revision and reversal of the idea that America was beset by a Negro problem. Greener called out various forms of bias, ignorance, and empty self-congratulation by white people, and finished by exploring the thought that the fact of being different is a blessing to black Americans because it has allowed them to avoid these kinds of pitfalls and value equality instead. They feel that they are first of all American citizens and secondarily Negroes. From their reading, observation, and reflection, they are not sure but that the very fact of their origin may have been the means, under God's guidance of the universe, of saving them from illiberal prejudices, from overweening race pride, from utter disregard of other races' rights, feelings, and privileges, and from intellectual narrowness and bigotry. Thomas Nelson Baker was born enslaved in Virginia in 1860, but in the wake of slavery's end after the Civil War, his studies at the Hampton Institute started him on a journey of education that culminated in a doctoral degree in philosophy from Yale University. This was the first instance of an African American obtaining the highest degree in philosophy within the United States, a goal Baker attained in 1903, the same year that Du Bois published The Souls of Black Folk. Baker's dissertation was entitled the ethical significance of the connection between mind and body. It drew practical conclusions about treatment of the body from an account of the body as the condition of the mind. Having established himself as a philosopher with this dissertation, Baker published a series of philosophical reflections on black pride and the fight against racism. These appeared over the course of the first decade of the 20th century in Alexander's Magazine, a Boston-based black journal, as well as other venues. For example, in the September and October 1906 issues of Alexander's, he published in two parts an essay entitled Ideals, inquiring first into the general nature of ideals as a form of motivation, and then discussing what ought to count as proper ethical and aesthetic ideals for Black people in America. Baker did all this writing, including his dissertation, while serving as the pastor of a church in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, as it happens just down the road from where I myself got my own bachelor's degree at Williams College. Du Bois hailed from nearby in western Massachusetts, which is worth mentioning, because it brings us to an underexplored moment of conflict in the history of Africana philosophy. We have in mind Du Bois's public and private criticism of Baker in the spring of 1906. The conflict can be linked with a point in Baker's ideals that seems at least somewhat Du Boisian. Baker draws a contrast between ethics and aesthetics, pointing out that whereas morality seems to have universal scope, aesthetic value is diverse. He writes, if the kingdom of man is ever to come, that is to say, man as God intended him to be, and not man such as sin made him, our ethical ideals must be one for all races and nations of men. But if race integrity is to be maintained, and each race develop its own peculiar racial gifts, and thus enrich the life of man on earth, then our aesthetical ideals of physical beauty must ever be different. 
talk of racial gifts is, of course, something we've repeatedly associated with Du Bois. Baker moves from here to lament what he sees as a common African-American predilection, namely the perversion of the aesthetical sense of physical beauty through a preference for white features. It is a problem he finds among both men and women. Thus, the essay's closing paragraph complains about educated black men showing a preference for lighter-skinned women. As he pursues this theme, however, he makes a startling suggestion that we overestimate how much mixture of blood resulted from rape under slavery and underestimate how much of it can be attributed to a perverse desire for mixed babies by enslaved women. A similar thought in a different essay, a piece called Not Pity But Respect, inspired Du Bois to write to both Baker himself and to the Congregationalist and Christian World, the periodical in which Baker published this piece. Baker had taken issues with protesters against segregated seating at a student volunteer movement convention, writing, When the Negro really feels as proud of being black as the white man does of being white, he will no longer feel humiliated by being seated by himself. Then furthermore, he expounded on his theme of the perverted aesthetical taste of some black women. In his letter to Baker, Du Bois said that this was the most cowardly and shameless thing I have recently read. And in his letter to the Congregationalist and Christian World, Du Bois accuses Baker of having treated the educated Christian Negro women who were delegates to the convention as little better than public prostitutes. In a recent commentary on this conflict, Neka Denny gave credit to Du Bois for his reaction while also noting its limits. She observes that Du Bois attempted to address black women's social marginalization, but in so doing, he adopted paternalistic attitudes towards black women. His focus remained limited to the respectability of educated middle or upper class black women. This little known dispute between Du Bois and Baker illustrates McClendon and Ferguson's claim that when we integrate the academic with the non-academic philosophers of the past, we will come closer to recovering and reconstructing the history that can aid us in our contemporary needs. Baker's thoughts on physical beauty and perverted aesthetic ideals will be best understood and most thoughtfully appreciated or rejected when they are placed in the context of his more abstract philosophical thoughts on the dependence of the mind on the body. We have counted Baker as a professional philosopher on the basis of his attainment of the PhD, but he did not hold a job as a philosophy professor at a university. The reverse of the situation that we saw with Richard Greener, who never got the PhD, but did work at the University of South Carolina. Gilbert Haven Jones, the last of the figures we'll mention who was born in the 19th century, managed both. He attained his PhD in philosophy in Germany at the University of Jena in 1909, with a dissertation on the metaphysics and psychology of the German philosopher Hermann Lotze and its relation to the theory of the person developed by Lotze's American student, Borden Parker Baum. When Jones came back to the United States after some time teaching at other black colleges, he taught at and eventually became president of Wilberforce University, a job his father had held some time before. As we mentioned in episode 66, while discussing Du Bois's time teaching there, Wilberforce is a black college associated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Jones would not be the last African-American professional philosopher to serve as Wilberforce's president, as Charles Leander Hill would follow him in this. Hill's dissertation, by the way, was on Philip Melanchthon, which makes for an interesting point of crossover with the current series of episodes on the Reformation, running parallel with this one. As McClendon and Ferguson point out, Jones and Hill are part of a significant number of African-American professional philosophers who served as presidents of historically black colleges and universities, sometimes known by the acronym HBCUs. Whether they were presidents or professors, most African-American professional philosophers during the first two-thirds of the 20th century were at HBCUs. Black students attending these institutions were surely benefited by exposure to black professional philosophers. But in this setting, these scholars often found it difficult to follow up on their doctoral work with a steady output of published writing. McClendon and Ferguson write that, the segregation of African-American philosophers in often underfunded black institutions limited their ability to pursue research and publication. Faced with enormous teaching loads, low salaries, professional isolation, limited resources, and enormous administrative responsibilities, many African-American philosophers were unable to publish their work. A terrible example of this isolation at black institutions 
is the story of Albert Miller Dunham Jr., elder brother of the famous dancer and choreographer Catherine Dunham. Albert studied at Harvard with Alfred North Whitehead and with George Herbert Mead at the University of Chicago, where he received his doctorate in 1933. He was given the opportunity by his alma mater to teach a summer course and hoped that this might be the gateway to membership of the faculty, but when it became known that the summer course was to be taught by a black man, over half of the enrolled students dropped the course. The class was not canceled, but unsurprisingly, the idea of Dunham joining the faculty at Chicago was abandoned. Alain Locke stepped in, bringing Dunham to teach at Howard University. But despite this safe harbor at a black institution, it is thought by many that Dunham's experience with racist exclusion contributed to his difficulties with depression. He died in 1949 in a psychiatric ward. With this sad history in view, let us meet some of the tiny handful of African-American philosophers who did manage to hold jobs in philosophy departments at predominantly white institutions before the 1970s. Cornelius Golightly was the first. Having gotten his PhD from the University of Michigan in 1941 and taught for a year at Howard, he spent most of the wartime in a non-academic government position. At the war's end, though, he was offered a position at Olivet College, a small liberal arts college in Michigan. He later worked at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, and Wayne State University in Detroit. The door Golightly opened was entered quickly by others, such as Forrest Wiggins and William Fontaine. Wiggins taught at a number of black colleges before he was hired by the University of Minnesota in 1946, becoming the first black person to obtain a full-time teaching appointment at the rank of instructor at a state university. His time at Minnesota was cut short, however, by racism in combination with McCarthyism. In spite of his popularity as a teacher and the recommendation by the philosophy department that he be promoted, he was denied tenure, almost certainly because of being a professed socialist. As for Fontaine, like Wiggins, he taught at a number of black colleges before achieving a tenure-track appointment at the University of Pennsylvania in 1949. This made him the first black philosopher at an Ivy League institution. Among the places he worked before this milestone was Lincoln University, where he served as mentor to none other than Kwame Nkrumah, who would go on to become the first president of Ghana. There are other figures we could introduce, like Francis Hammond, who received his PhD from the Université Laval in Quebec and got a job at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, where he became, in 1946, the first black philosopher to become the chair of the department at a predominantly white institution but rather than summarizing more career paths, let's turn to the paths that philosophy took in the work of the three pioneering philosophers we introduced a moment ago, Golightly, Wiggins, and Fontaine. All of them contributed to a central problem in modern philosophy. How can a scientific understanding of the world be reconciled with a concern for the place of values and valuing within it? One way to think about this problem is that science seems to offer objective, empirically verifiable descriptions in a way that is impossible in ethics or aesthetics. Thus, in an article of 1956 entitled Value as a Scientific Concept, Golightly poses the weighty question, is it possible to give value a real definition in the same way that scientists define cancer or oxygen? He suggests that this goal might be attained in the social sciences. Attending to the efforts of social scientists, would provide us with a unique opportunity to observe the process by which a philosophical concept is translated gradually into a scientific concept, something which he takes to have happened before in the cases of concepts like atom and evolution. In this article, Golightly takes the American anthropologist Clyde Cluckholm to have gone the furthest towards achieving this goal, so he spends most of his article exploring the intricacies of Cluckholm's view. In an earlier article entitled Social Science and Normative Ethics, Golightly had surveyed a more diverse array of social scientific works. He sought to understand how social scientists could avoid sneaking in hidden value judgments that compromise an external facade of objectivity, while also responsibly incorporating explicit value judgments as part of their pursuit of social planning and social criticism. These two, after all, are dimensions of social science. Reading these two articles by Golightly, both of which were published in the prestigious Journal of Philosophy, we see first and foremost a mid-20th century Western philosopher at the cutting edge of research into the relationship between science and philosophy. 
But was this a distinctive contribution to African-American philosophy in a way that Patrick Healy's achievements were not? Yes, for at least two reasons. Firstly, at the very heart of his article, Social Science and Normative Ethics, is an example of social scientific research concerning African-Americans. Golightly closely examines the Swedish sociologist Gunnar Myrdal's 1944 book, An American Dilemma, a groundbreaking study of race relations in the United States. He finds the book to be exemplary in its revelation of the present extent and limitations of value judgments in social science. Secondly, Golightly published another scholarly article in the same year called Race, Values, and Guilt. And here, his concern for the situation of Black people in the United States is obviously central. The piece asks how racial discrimination in America can be experienced by those who practice or condone it as compatible with the ideal of democracy. In its attempt to uncover the psychological and social mechanisms at work here, the article perfectly exemplifies Golightly's fascination with how social science can both help us to understand social problems and figure out how to change them. Forrest Wiggins, too, seeks to both understand and change the world in concert with science, in articles like Ethics and Economics from 1945 and The Data and Evaluation of Business from 1948. In both articles, he seeks to show that a proper understanding of the relationship between economics as a science and morality as a source of value judgments will ultimately lead us to recognize capitalism as a system that needs to be destroyed if humans are to flourish and reach their full potential. Wiggins, too, was operating within the sphere of Africana philosophy, which is clear not so much from what he said in this socialist critique of economic thought as where he said it. Ethics and Economics was published in Philon, a journal founded by Du Bois at Atlanta University in 1940. McClendon and Ferguson identify Philon as a very important venue for work by African-American professional philosophers in the time before the 1970s, with other important examples being the AME Church Review and the Journal of Religious Thought, published by Howard University's School of Divinity. Coming now to William Fontaine, he certainly shared Golightly and Wiggins's concern with social science, as can be seen in a number of his publications. But for our purposes, the most striking example of his reflections on the relationship between science and value is his article, Philosophical Implications of the Biology of Dr. Ernest E. Just, published in the Journal of Negro History in 1939. Ernest Everett Just was a pioneering African-American biologist who earlier that year had published his most important book, The Biology of the Cell Surface. Fontaine's article highlights how Just contributes in this book not merely to the advancement of cell biology, but to the clarification of such major philosophical questions as the distinction between life and non-life. Contrary to attempts to distinguish living matter from non-living matter by attributing some vital principle, such as spirit or soul, to living beings, Just identifies life as the chemical result of a particular organization of matter. Furthermore, Just isolates the importance of the ectoplasm, or the outer layer of the cell, as, in Fontaine's words, the most concrete expression of the life process. Fontaine endorses this idea, writing that, after Just's work, all truly scientific speculations concerning life origins, as well as the cause of evolution, must take this as their starting point. Fontaine closes his article with a reflection on the relationship between science and art, inspired by Just's reflections on the majesty and beauty of the cell. As Just writes, we feel the beauty of nature because we are part of nature and because we know that, however much in our separate domains we abstract from the unity of nature, this unity remains. Here, Fontaine engages in philosophy of science in a way that purposefully highlights it as a dimension of Africana philosophy, since he is reflecting on African-American advances in science. Ernest Just taught at Howard, as did a number of the professional philosophers we have mentioned in this episode. This was, of course, Alan Locke's institutional home, where he long served as chair of the philosophy department. His successor in this role, Eugene Holmes, is interesting to compare with figures who worked at predominantly white institutions. Where Wiggins's socialism led to his dismissal from the University of Minnesota, Holmes was an avowed communist who managed to work with a number of other leftist black scholars at Howard, so much so that McClendon and Ferguson place him at the center of a distinctive school of thought. He also engaged in the philosophy of science, 
writing on the physics of space and time. Another professional philosopher who worked for some time at Howard was Joyce Mitchell Cook, who will strike the attentive listener as the first woman we've mentioned in this episode. Cook was, in fact, the first black woman to earn her PhD in philosophy. She achieved this in 1965 and at Yale University, where Baker had been the first black man to get such a doctorate in the United States. Pleasingly, then, we can now end our story exactly a century from when we started it, where 1865 was the date of abolition, 1965 saw the Voting Rights Act, a key moment in the end of segregation as a legal system. Having become Dr. Cook in this year, about a decade later in 1976, Joyce Cook would team up with two other black professional philosophers, William R. Jones and Robert C. Williams, to do a groundbreaking panel at a meeting of the American Philosophical Association on the meaning and future of black philosophy. As that suggests, there is more to say about African-American professional philosophy from the 1970s onward, and we'll return to that topic in a future episode. But next time, we'll be turning instead to the past, as we look at another figure with impressive academic credentials, Carter G. Woodson, another figure who worked, albeit briefly, at Howard University, and who got a PhD from Harvard in 1912. The difference is that his degree was not in philosophy, but in history. This was very much his specialist subject. Woodson showed how historical research and education could be a tool for racial uplift. So join us next time as we put some extra history into the history of Africana philosophy. <music>